So they, they've they've introduced this this bill, the For the People Act of 2021, and uh, they they frame it uh, to expand the American uh, expand Americans' access to the ballot box, reduce the influence of big money in politics, strengthen ethics rules for public servants, and implement other anti-corruption measures for the purpose of fortifying our democracy and for other purposes. Right. Is, is there anyone in their right mind who'd like to put their hands up and say, yes, I trust the Democrats to do this? Like anyone? Like anyone in the chat? Like, let's, let's, like literally, can we get anyone who believes that they are going to strengthen ethics rules for public servants or that they are going to implement anti-corruption measures and that they're going to make sure that all of the elections are completely secure and there's no problem? I mean, this is... I just don't. I just don't believe them. There is just no trust, in my opinion, here. Right. So they want things like uh, internet same day registration for voting. Okay, maybe for children. Weird. Why should children be registered to vote? I just don't know. Um, then they want, of course, universal mail in ballots. I think it was what was the what was the tech company who was having the uh, insider unions, and they were like, we're not going to have... Amazon. It was Amazon, was it? Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. So they were like, we're not going to have mail-in ballots because they're open to fraud. It's like, we're going to do mail-in ballots on a union proposition. Yeah. But, and then Amazon were like, no, 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 we don't trust mail-in ballots. Like, that's interesting. But the Democrats do want them for the entire country. Yeah. If an individual in a state is eligible to cast a vote for an election and for a federal office, the state may not impose any additional conditions or requirements on the eligibility of the individual to cast the vote in such election by an absentee va- ballot. So it's like, right, okay, that's fine. Uh, Interestingly, they also want something called automatic registration, which means that uh, the system registers an individual to vote in elections for federal offices in a state, and if eligible, by electronically transferring the information necessary for registration from government agencies to election officials of that state, unless they affirmatively deny that they want to be registered. So this is going to be just random people who go to get their driving license or something, don't bother checking, like, you know, whatever tick box it is on the form, and then get their information. Suddenly you're automatically registered to vote. So you may not even know. You suddenly know? you're voting democrat <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> exactly suddenly you're voting for biden as well isn't that really weird right and so that that i mean to me these are massive red flags and i wouldn't i wouldn't trust any of the democrats to do any of this right and then they've got a, a, you would think they would leave you know get into office okay we're being accused of voter fraud we don't think we did it so let's just leave it alone for a couple of years oh no 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 well they, they've got a, a slew of other like good sounding terms right prohibiting deceptive practices and preventing voter intimidation really Fucking really. The, sorry, I don't mean me swear, but right, the gall, the gall of the people who've been practicing deceptive practices and voter intimidation are suddenly going to be like, yeah, so we're against that and we're going to be preventing that in future. Democracy restoration, poll worker recruitment and training, el- federal election integrity, election security, preventing election hacking, <laughs> deterring foreign interference in elections, secret money transparency. Restoring integrity to America's elections and saving eligible voters from voter purging. I don't (laughs) believe you. I do not trust you. I think that all of this is a front for you to do exactly the things that you are going to claim you're going to try and prevent. I'm just, no. Ironic and totally untrustworthy. There's also the point here, like, if you want to agree that, you know, Democrat position... Well, if you're changing so much legislation, are you agreeing that the system might have a few kinks in it? (laughs) But it's, it's... I mean, I just don't believe it. So anyway, moving on to um, Imperator Biden. And uh, he's being accused of being a benevolent dictator. This uh, a White House press briefing last week on Thursday. Uh, Jen Psaki, the, the circling back lady, uh, failed to circle back on this. Uh, she just gave a straight up statement, actually, which was quite nice. She was asked if Biden sees himself as a benevolent dictator. Uh, and because he had said that a reliance on executive orders... Uh, meant that you couldn't, and he'd said, he can't legislate by executive order unless you're a dictator. And so in his first week, he put out something like 33 executive orders. Uh, we've got a summary of which on lotuses.com by Josh. And uh, and yeah, so he, he had said, I have this strange notion, we're a democracy. If you can't get the votes, you can't legislate by executive order unless you're a dictator. We're a democracy. We need consensus. Well, that's gone. Until we need consensus right up until the point where Biden gets in office. Then it's executive action, executive action. It was literally like him on a table just being past these things, signing it, being past these things. Yeah, there's, there's a clip of him saying under his breath, what I, am I signing? Yeah, I don't know what I'm signing. Like this one? I don't really yeah. know what the hell it is, but... Okay. Yeah, just sign it anyway. It's like, okay. Um, and so, yeah, so this was uh, Jem Psaki's incredible response to this. 
question is pretty important context for everybody. And he said no. And the president also said during an interview with columnists uh, back in December that he didn't think executive action should be used for everything. And that certainly is his point of view. But there are steps, including overturning some of the harmful, detrimental, and yes, immoral actions of the prior administration that he felt he could not wait to, to overturn. And that's exactly what he did. Well, there we go. If you don't like what the previous administration did, you may be against executive orders, but if you find that what the previous guy had done was immoral, then use as many as you like. There's no apparent restriction. It's just fine. You can become a dictator if you think it's morally justified to if be a dictator. If you're fighting dictatorships, you can be a dictator. Yeah. It, it's just as if you can give yourself moral license. And uh, we know how difficult it is for people to find what they do morally justifiable. I mean, most people don't do anything because they don't find anything they do morally justifiable. Not nonsense. Nonsense. You know, that is just a blank check to say, well, I feel like it, therefore I will do it. That's all she said there. But, um, but anyway, he has brought forward legislation as well. And... Um, <laughs> the Democrats, showing that they're committed to the democratic process, are doing everything they can to just bypass the Republicans. <laughs> like, we don't want your opinion. We don't want your goddamn opinion, right? This is from NBC News. Democrats are discussing a path to bypass the Republicans and approve an aggressive COVID-19 relief package on a party-line basis. Prospects with bipartisan support uh, for his top priority diminish. Uh, exec White House economic advisor Brian Deese and COVID coordinator Jeff Zients held a call on Thursday with Democrats where they could uh, cu uh, cut a slim-down deal and use a process known as a reconciliation to bypass the Senate's 60-vote rule to avoid a filibuster. Uh, the sentiment is this. We would like Republicans to work with us and be part of the solution to deliver emergency help, but we can't wait. It's urgent and we need to double track this process, says uh, Senator Chris Van Hollen, uh, who was on the call. So we will continue to reach out to Republicans, but I'm a big supporter of having an insurance policy in place through reconciliation. That's incredible, isn't it? Like, if your interests are having a functional republic, then your interests, I would say, are in danger. They're being overridden. You have an executive president who doesn't care about your opinion and feels morally justified in just doing what he likes. And then when legislation is actually brought to the, the Senate, they're just like, yeah, you know what, we're just going to try and get around the Republicans because we think they might actually be in the way. So if you are uh, an American, I think that it's not unrealistic to say that the Democrats are essentially abandoning your system of democracy at the moment. Uh, this is this is something they just don't seem to care about anymore. Uh, looking forward to seeing how Biden packs the Supreme Court too, but we haven't got any news on that yet, but that's sure to come. But, um, but what all this essentially, what the entire podcast we've been laying out today is essentially outlining the shape of the cathedral and how it is a giant and vast institution. Uh, the, the People, you know, will conflate with like the deep state or, you know, the social justice warriors and things like this. But it's really all part of the same thing. I mean, look at this. This is five federal judges. I think it actually went up to eight. I think it was uh, in total who essentially just came out and said, well, I'm resigning as a judge. It's like, why? So Biden can pick my replacement appears to be the actual... Uh, reasoning being given by the Huffington Post. They say, oh, while judges, of course, have many personal reasons for retiring or semi-retiring, it's safe to say for the most part that the timing of these judges isn't uh, departures isn't coincidental. They wanted Biden to pick their replacements. And of course, many of Trump's judges fitted a particular mold. They were white, male, right-wing ideologues. Oh, yes, yes. Trump, Trump picked absolute radicals for his court picks. But, um, but anyway, as you can see, like the, the institutions are all marching in lockstep here. They all know what they're doing, and they're doing it for a reason. They're advancing the same goals and the same agendas. And this means we're back to the same old kind of corruption. The, the first one being just what's, what's going on with Maxine Waters and her daughter, in fact. If we can get the next one up, John. This is a great report by the Post Millennial uh, that details how, um, according to reports, uh, records from the Federal Election Commission, Maxine Waters gave more than a million daughter to her a uh, million dollars to her daughter uh, since 2003 because of her various election campaigns. Uh, the latest influx of cash, which was $250,000, came from the most re recent election cycle. And this is she she gets paid huge amounts of money to produce leaflets. That uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars on leaflets. That uh, you know, it's not an unusual thing for California Democrats to do this either. Incidentally, um, so yeah, if this isn't nepotism, I don't know how else you could describe it. I mean, maybe nepotism could also be described as Kamala Harris's stepdaughter getting a modeling contract. 
I mean, I'm not going to judge, but I'm just saying I I don't think this was meritorious. Uh, but yes, this is a, her, her stepdaughter has been given a modeling contract. None more worthy, I say. Um, but the most important one, if we're going to be talking about nepotism in the, uh, the, the, the daughter is the one on the right there, as you can. Oh. The one uh, on the left's better. I mean, I'm, I just, anyway. Wouldn't either, but you know. But anyway, right. So the, the nepotism seems to be in full swing. These people are giving their children huge amounts of taxpayer money. And when it comes to getting money in a corrupt nepotistic family, of course, King Biden, the phony king of America, is the guy to be looking at. But it turns out that Hunter Biden is safe. Can we get the next one up? Tucker Carlson did, again, th this is why they want to get this guy off the air, right? Because yeah. he keeps doing things that are good. He's way too effective. He is way too effective. Right, so uh, he uh, he found out that Biden had appointed a chap called Nicholas McQuaid to be the chief, uh, the Justice, de Justice Department's uh, acting chief. Well, who is Nicholas McQuaid? If we can go to the next one, this is reported by the Washington Examiner. This is amazing, right? He's a former federal prosecutor. Uh, he was... Um, Picked as the uh, acting chief justice. Uh, the Hunter Biden investigation that is underway has been confirmed. And it has been confirmed that he's under federal investigation. So Carlson points out that um, McQuaid worked with Christopher Clark as partners at Latham and Watkins and worked together on cases right up until McQuaid took, a, took the job at the Justice Department. On January the 21st of this year, the same day that Nicholas McQuaid was featured in the Justice Department press release, uh, Latham and Watkins filed a motion in court to withdraw McQuaid as an attorney in a case he was working on with Christopher Clark. So that means that Joe Biden put at the head of the criminal division the partner of the guy his son had hired to defend him against the criminal division. Just the swamp. It is the swampiest swamp. We've reached out to the Justice Department for a comment on this. They refuse to say whether McQuaid would recuse himself for matters involving Hunter Biden and his former partner, who is representing Hunter Biden. It's all pretty amazing. Another reminder, there's a lot going on within the Biden family. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's genuinely amazing. So, someone who there is... I mean, <clears throat> the amount of evidence that Hunter Biden has been taking money from foreign governments is just catastrophic for anyone who would be not connected in a familial way to the Biden family, right? If, it, if his name wasn't Hunter Biden, he'd be in jail by now, right? Hmm. The we, we have lots of evidence, lots of witnesses, uh, a money trail that connects all of this together. It is all out in the open. Got a paper trail. We've got a paper literally, trail. Literally like emails with his name in. Literally. We've got the, the associates, the Tony Bublinski, the guy he was working with, saying, yeah, that's what he was doing. Like, it's it couldn't be more clear, right? <laughs> the nepotism will show. And then, so what happens? Oh, Biden puts someone in place in the Justice Department, who is directly tied to Hunter Biden. Just what can you do? What the hell can you do? Well, i tell you what they can do. They can start investigating Elon Musk. That's what they can do. Why not? Why wouldn't the Justice Department, as soon as this guy's gone in, why wouldn't they go after Elon Musk? Because this, and this is the best thing in the world, right? So the, the complaint against SpaceX was of hiring discrimination. Well, who were they discriminating against? <laughs> the charges allege that on or about 10th of March 2020, uh, during uh, the, the charging party's interview for the position of technology strategy associate, SpaceX made inquiries about his citizenship status and ultimately failed to hire him for the position because he was not a US citizen or lawful resident. That's the law. Yes. SpaceX has, yes. has to say, by law, we yes. don't hire non-Americans. Exactly. Elon Musk is in trouble for doing the right thing. <laughs> Well, he's in trouble for following a law that, you know, the U.S. government has set. Yes. I mean, he was asked about this. I think we may have played it before. Some Russian lady was like, why do you not hire non-Americans? He's like, well, because it's rocket technology. And the U.S. government says this is sensitive. Therefore, no foreigners. Yep. You know. E e Elon Musk is doing the right thing. He has done exactly what is supposed to have been done. Mm. And the... They know it. They like, know there's it. There's no way they don't know this. <laughs> but... But they're just investigating him on the basis that, what, well, he's tweeted out Bitcoin again. Well, exactly. It's a way of leveraging the institutions that are now controlled by the establishment, the cathedral, against those dissidents who are outside of it. He's uh, tweeting game stonk. Get him. Exactly. But that's not that's not the only thing. right? There's another investigation in SpaceX that's going on. Again, this all just looks like it's vindictive because of Elon Musk's sort of you know, parasocial me or sort of metasocial position on in the culture war, right? But the next one is uh, SpaceX apparently violated some kind of regulation with their 
test flight that went on in December. Um, if we can get the next one up, John. Uh, yeah, so this this is a, a Federal Aviation Administration probe that's going on against them uh, because the December launch of uh, serial number eight Starship prototype uh, was as hailed as a success, success by Musk. Uh, it reached its eight-mile high ascent and failed on the descent and crashed. Uh, this apparently... Uh, caused an investigation which was opened last week, focusing not only on the explosive landing, but on SpaceX's refusal to stick to the terms of what the FAA authorised to people involved with it have said. But it's unclear what part of the test flight violated the FAA licence, and an FAA spokesman declined to specify in a statement to The Verge. Why? <laughs> because it's another phony lawsuit. Because it's it's just about putting Elon Musk on notice. It's about just trying to find something, trying to dig something up. It's much like the Russiagate investigation. I mean, There's nothing here. Elon Musk, the wealthiest man in the world, you don't think he's got his own lawyers who would look over these kind of things? Yeah. Like, yeah. There he is, would just there say, is look, no way he'd risk breaking the law for something like this. Exactly. He'd be like, look, just, just put us in line with whatever regulations are. I don't care. Just make it do it. You know, make it happen. But, uh, but yeah, the question is, why is Elon Musk the, the target? And of course, it's because of his support of the Game Stonk Uprising. Uh, even Discord has gone corpo. This is just one random article just to highlight how he's we, talking We've about covered it. him support of Yeah, we, we've covered this more than enough. Support of uh, basically dissidents yeah. anywhere. Yeah, like he's he's not the little one of these guy. Corpo types. Exactly, he's not part of the establishment. He's a he's whereas an, you know, take Bill Gates. Like, what is Bill Gates' allegiance like? I'm not, you know, I'm not one of those people who believes that you know he wants to murder the world and all this. But well, yeah. he's he's obviously not one of these people who is sort of fighting part of the culture war or uh, yeah. on the side of dissidents. No, he seems to be definitely the kind of person who will work with people who are corrupt. Abs absolutely. He's he's a part of this kind of globalist establishment. Elon Musk is clearly not part of this globalist establishment. Trump is clearly not part of this globalist establishment. But they are clearly very firmly back in control, and they're leveraging all of the institutions they can against the cultural opposition. And this has been, like we said in the first segment, this has all been compressed into, essentially, Gamergate. And it's like, okay, that's embarrassing for you guys isn't it what's happening we're getting waxed by a bunch of nerds in their basements it's like oh dear 